Okay. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Juan Duran. <clears throat> I would like to uh, present my my talk today. Um, one of the things that I want to try to do here is try to um, understand how is it possible um, to uh, claim some credibility on the results of machine learning. So let me try to motivate um, my talk a little bit more. So uh, one of the, the, the type of um, algorithm that I'm mostly interested in here um, are so-called black box algorithms. So uh, one of the problems with this, um, this kind of uh, algorithms is that, well, they are epistemically, uh, what is called is epistemically opaque. So that, that is, we cannot survey all the uh, steps that justify the output of the algorithm. That would be more or less the formal definition of epistemic capacity or epistemic inaccessibility. So that's the kind of algorithms that I'm interested in. Of course, there are a bunch of uh, these algorithms in healthcare and medical AI. Those are uh, super um, important because it adds a, a layer of concern regarding the sensitivity of the domain where the algorithm is being um, used. So of course, this, this adds some, um, some extra constraints. But I want to use those constraints uh, in terms of motivating my, or uh, the need of uh, being uh, as certain as possible about uh, the output of these systems. Um, so what I want to do is I want to um, uh, use an example to, to also to motivate my talk. Um, so the example that I'm going to be using is not exactly in healthcare, but uh, he has been used in, in, in health in, in past times, um, which is uh, uh, what I call it a, a, a case of phrenology with extra steps. So the idea here is this is a standard uh, procedures um, regarding machine learning where you have um, a database, which is your, your training database. Uh, in this case, you have two categories, criminals and non-criminals. And uh, you train your da database, um, particularly uh, you train your machine learning. Your machine learning in this particular case uses uh, try to pick picks out um, try to pick out the uh, facial traits of the that there are in the pictures because the claim of the authors of this paper is that we can uh, um, identify and classify criminality based on facial traits. Okay, so facial traits determine uh, uh, criminality. And then you, you use your, um, your test database and then you sort of have certain, you know, uh, percentage of accuracy regarding uh, the classification um, carried out by the machine learning. So this is, this is a, I know this is um, a simplification of standard machine learning um, algorithms and it's a little bit of a caricaturization in a way, but I think that the, these, these sort of uh, uh, cases um, it's, it's, it's representative of, of many other machine learning cases. So one of the problems that I see with this particular case, and again, it ex extends to uh, all the similar cases, is that, well, uh, first off, the, the system is, is required to choose between two categories. So of course, the system is going to uh, attach some probability of fitting one case or the other, but at the end of the day, it seems to me that either you are a criminal or you're not a criminal. So that could uh, bring just being so, so, um, so um, uh, stiff, I suppose, in your categories, it could, uh, it could bring some, some concerns regarding your, the quality, let's say, the, the scientific soundness, the credibility, that's what I'm, I'm aiming at here uh, of your machine learning. Um, another thing that I see in, in these sort of cases is that fossilizes concepts. So here the idea is, um, this is, this is a, a problem that we can hardly um, get away um, uh, from, which is essentially uh, you put a, a concept, like concept of criminality in this case, and essentially whatever definition you have uh, is there, has been implemented on, on, the, on the system, and it doesn't really matter if you're if, if, if the cases change, the, um, so the communities where you apply this uh, changes, it, it really doesn't matter that the, 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 the concept has been fixed 
um, across uh, the the board, and in, 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 uh, insofar as you apply it to specific databases, is going to be that concept is the one that's going to be used in those databases. And you can think this um, to have important repercussions also in cases like you know the concept of health aid, uh, healthcare, the concept of illness, uh, the concept of disease, and so on. Um, okay, and another thing is, and this is perhaps the most uh, obvious of all, is that it's uh, largely disconnected uh, from uh, larger bodies of belief, or scientific belief. So it's, um, it's ignoring uh, biological and social traits, uh, it's ignoring the social construction of crime, it's ignoring socioeconomic basis of criminality, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this point, and I'm going to I'm going to mention why I think this is uh, this is an important thing. Okay, so um, if if this is in, in, in these particular situations where we have this consistency, in which it is very very obvious that we should not trust the outcome of the system, we should not put people in prison because the system uh, says so. Uh, then um, the question is, how, why are we um, believing this in, in this? You know, what reasons do we have to be justified in believing? This results. So what I want to do um, is uh, to have a rundown on the current efforts on credibility, and I'm going to be talking about explainability uh, because the workshop is on explainability. I'm a little bit um, away from explainability in the sense that I'm not going to be addressing explainability directly. However, I will uh, come back to the problem of explainability in the context uh, of computational reliabilism, which is what I want to um, tell you a little bit more about, which is my current uh, work. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more of what this computational reliabilism is, or how I um, portray it um, to be. And uh, well, it, m m all of you, or most of you will know what um, reliabilism is, and this is just essentially a, a branch out of process reliabilism. Uh, so um, the, the question is, uh, how can we identify the right reliability indicators? And uh, because this is a work in progress and there's um, a lot of things to do, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about how I feel about the merits uh, of computational reliabilism, why it's uh, worth pursuing it, and uh, which are the limits that I currently face. And I'm pretty sure that you will see more and I will be um, very happy to hear uh, what you have to uh, say about it. Okay, so let me um, get into this uh, quick uh, rundown of the current efforts on credibility on how to deem this um, results credible. And I should perhaps make a, make a note here, uh, a footnote, um, uh, which is why I'm not, or just try to answer the question why I'm not talking about trustworthiness. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is to stay purely on, on epistemic grounds. I'm not I, I believe that the concept of credibility um, embraces, uh, you know, other disciplines that I will not be addressing here, such as um, the sociology of science, such as uh, testimony, and that sort of thing that I will not be uh, discussing today. Um, I'm, I would not be surprised if those components should eventually be incorporated as reliability indicators, but, um, but right now I'm not going to be uh, addressing those um, that part of the uh, philosophical studies, and I'm I'm just going to be focusing on uh, credibility in this in this interpretation that I'm giving. Okay, so um, I think that the there are three very interesting paths, what I call paths uh, to credibility. One of them is transparency, uh, the second one is uh, accuracy, and the third one is uh, explainability. So um, um, I I will uh, oppose to all three. On different grounds, um, I think that the transparency has um, a major problem, which is that it depends on uh, an interpretable pre predictor. Uh, an interpretable predictor essentially is uh, um, an algorithm which is exogenous to the main uh, machine learning algorithm that helps to uh, connect certain modules, certain functions, uh, certain aspect of the algorithm with the output. So by doing this, we um, can create some kind of path dependency and we can see how the algorithm works. 
Uh, this is the, the, the metaphor used for this is to see the inner workings of the algorithm, right? Now, uh, there are different efforts on, um, um, to transparency. Uh, one is to come out with different interpretive predictors. Uh, the other one is try to use a little bit more of software engineering. There is a, uh, a paper recently in Philosophy of Science published on this. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to uh, think that software engineering can um, actually give us the transparency conditions that we need. Um, and if anything, that software engineering is I uh, cash it out in computational reliabilism. So I think that that, that could be uh, an interesting trade um, uh, of sorts, but th I'm not going to be talking too much about that. So uh, coming back to uh, transparency, if transparency um, is understood as uh, requiring a third party algorithm, I'm going to call it like this, it's not really a third party, it's an, epic, an algorithm exogenous to the main algorithm. Just to simplify concepts here, this third party algorithm uh, which is the interpretable predictor. Uh, essentially, um, there are no questions about the transparency of this algorithm. So um, it seems to me that we could be facing some, some issues regarding uh, algorithm regress and the transparency of that algorithm regress, right? So um, another thing that I that puts me really uh, on the, uh, across the, uh, the street with uh, regarding transparency is that it is um, assumed um, uh, in many, in, in much of the literature, it is assumed uh, without further argumentation that uh, we as humans, uh, human agents, we are able to understand the output of the uh, interpretable predictor. Uh, I think that that's an unwarranted um, claim and it should be reviewed. I think everything has to do with looking into the algorithm, like opening it up as it were, uh, it, it, it should be, uh, suspicious um, from the beginning because this principle of epistemic opacity, to my mind anyway, um, cuts across all algorithm, even even the simplest one. Simplest one. I, I, I mean that that could be a, a way to push back against my argument, but since I'm talking about um, black box algorithm, I think that that's a, that's a given. So regarding accuracy, uh, one of the problems that I see with accuracy it enables closed systems. Here, the idea of a closed system would be something like uh, I can produce, I can, I can train my algorithm using a database of which I have no connections with. It's not, it's not data that I collected from, from the world, let's put it that way. Uh, and then I test my, um, this algorithm with more synthetic data, essentially. And then I can have accuracy. And my algorithm can be highly, very extremely accurate and have no correlations with it, oh, no relations to the world, no form of representation of any kind. Um, so, and this is, this is what's, uh, I think this, this is one of, what is one of the things that is happening with the case of Wen Yang, the, the case of the uh, phrenology, um, phrenology with extra steps, um, which essentially uh, allows me to have a highly accurate, or according to the authors anyway, a highly accurate algorithm and with now relations to the world whatsoever. Uh, of course, we know that accuracy is tailored to the efficiency of the computation and the quality of data. If that drops, accuracy drops, and therefore it's not really a, a good way to measure our credibility. And finally, there are some technical issues regarding overfitting and the accuracy paradox, which, um, yeah, those are uh, well known. Uh, finally, explainability. Explainability is, um, is the, is the di most difficult one for me to uh, make a case against. But this is what I think. Uh, first, uh, first of all, uh, in many cases, the concept, uh, the concept of uh, explainability depends on the concept of transparency. So we don't have explainability unless we have uh, transparency, which uh, if this is the case, um, we essentially back go back to the first um, set of um, concerns that I had. Uh, but the second one, and this is a little bit more um, difficult perhaps, but uh, let me give it a try to it. So here the idea is that um, if we are using uh, explainability to determine uh, the credibility of our results, so we explain results to deem them credible. So I, I believe, I'm justifying believing these results because I'm able to come up with an explanation. But the problem that I see is that explainability, at least um, according to philosophy of science, 
in a more or less traditional view, um, you essentially you cannot explain what is false. I mean, if we assume that premise, if we cannot explain what is false, then uh, which is the factivity condition, and and and, and this is this is a, a, a renewed version of Hempel's factivity condition. It doesn't have to be that kind of factivity condition, but the idea is some kind of a weak factivity condition in the in the sense that we cannot explain that is what is false, and therefore we need to have some degree of truth or and this is this is this is where the, the big leap is really um, some form of credibility on the results in order to explain them. Uh, so I cannot explain something that I have no credibility about that I'm not justified in believing in the first place. So if that, if that were the case, then there is some kind of a problem here because credibility is prior to explainability. And if that were the case, I cannot use explainability to uh, credit credibility um, or just sanction credibility on the results because it's prior. So um, I see that that could bring some sort of, um, uh, yeah, some some kind of circular argument of, of, some, of some kind. Uh, but this is obviously open to interpretation. I, I still think that we are absolutely safe if we uh, separate credibility from uh, explainability and we treat them independently and perhaps one dependent on the other um, at, at some level, but not in the sense that we have a, a winner takes all strategy, namely transparency or namely uh, explainability. All right, so um, moving on. So, uh, what is computational reliabilism? So, like I, like I mentioned before, this is this is just a branch out of uh, process reliabilism. I'm, I'm thinking of Goldman, 1979, uh, what is uh, justified belief. Uh, but uh, there are many other versions, and Goldman himself he has um, updated his, his version. Um, so, well, essentially the idea is that process reliabilism tells you that if you have a process. You know that produces true beliefs most of the time, then that process is reliable. And once you sanction a process as being reliable, then you are good to go. Now there have been a lot of uh, oh um, before that, uh, we also allow to have some sort of um, error, I suppose, or failure in uh, in our system in our process. So our process can once in a while give us a false um, uh, belief, but we still. Uh, because this is a frequentist theory, we are still uh, justifying believing that the process is reliable and that the results are credible. Yeah, so that is essentially the idea. Um, with computational reliability, I'm not going to get into that. But with computational reliability, um, um, I sort of um, overcome some of the criticism um, that uh, Goldman receives. Uh, on his um, process reliabilism, um, so but like I said, I'm not I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay, so if you think that I'm potentially right about something, if if it's if it's even sound what I'm saying, then the next step is which all it's, it's consist in identifying the reliability indicators that allow me to sanction a process as reliable. In this case, the process is going to be the machine, learn the machine learning correct. So what I did is divided into three different uh, very large groups. The first one is I call it computational instruments. And these uh, uh, reliability indicators essentially um, illustrate a point to everything that have to do with uh, the computer as an instrument. Uh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say more about this in a minute. So then I focus on what I call computational based scientific practice. So we know that computers have pervaded um, scientific practice, whether they're computer simulations, big data, machine learning, AI, you name it. And um, but I also think that there are certain changes in the way that we are carrying out uh, scientific practice. So what I what I want to focus here is not in the um, algorithm that essentially does computation is a little bit more complicated than the calculator, but rather the kind of system that is, uh, to use Paul Humphrey's ideas, is a new epistemic authority. Um, and is in a way displacing humans from the, um, the enterprise of knowledge. So if, if we are in this, in this neighborhood, in this vicinity, 
then the idea here is that the way that we carry out uh, scientific practice is not, oh, it is, it has some, some, some kind of a, a special, um, or it should require special treatment. And that's what I'm trying to do there. Now, finally, and this is the, the most complicated one for me right now, is what I call the social formation of beliefs. This is not even my uh, career. Um, yeah, I, I didn't even come up with that, that, that term. It's just something that tries to portray what, what I'm thinking here. And what I'm thinking is that once you have certain results from the machine learning, you want uh, a certain community of scientists or perhaps uh, different stakeholders, you want them to uh, be participants in the, in the in the process of granting credibility to uh, a set of results. So I'm, I'm going to try to explain this a little bit more uh, in a minute when I when I address this. Uh, but it's let me warn you from from now that it's um, yeah it's it is not it's a it's a problem for me. So <laughs> let me put it that way and let's let's see how how it goes. All right. So essentially uh, here is. Um, an idea that uh, so the, there are three uh, reliability indicators, so three three um, belief forming processes, which um, uh, which uh, yeah, so that, that are um, completely tailored to uh, computers, and in a way, and that um, and then aim at uh, granting reliability to the machine learning, and those are uh, well the uh, verification and validation methods, which have um, relation to accuracy. So we are rescuing accuracy in a way, robustness analysis, and a history of successful and unsu successful implementations. And the, the, the third one has to do with the, um, uh, so in computer, computer practice, computer science practice, there are um, very, there, there are several ways of, of carrying out uh, uh, the, the development, the design development the coding, the execution of an algorithm. Uh, and this have to do with a lot with um, software engineering that I was mentioning earlier. And um, so what I'm trying to do is trying to capitalize on those practices, which are, uh, to my mind, absolutely exclusive uh, um, of, um, yeah, computer science. Uh, now, these ideas are not new. I already published this before. Uh, and I did it in the context of computer simulations. Uh, actually, this. The, the, the idea of computational reliabilism is not mentioned like that, but it's already in my PhD dissertation. So um, these ideas have been um, flowing around uh, f um, for some time now, um, and we finally put it in, in, in on paper. Uh, and I think that this has to do with uh, just the, the computer in itself. Uh, so there are, there are um, but probably there are more things to say, but, but uh, for now, I think I'm happy with that. So um, the fourth um, reliability indicator that I, I also had, that I also mentioned here in these papers is what I call the expert knowledge. This is just an umbrella term to try to, you know, put together everything to do with um, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, practices and, and knowledge that comes from uh, different areas in, in, in the practice. Uh, of uh, computer-based scientific, um, yeah, practice. <laughs> so um, it, it's just just an umbrella term trying to to put everything together. Uh, perhaps we can we can think of I don't know reproducibility of results, some some specific practices that some um, some communities have, uh, and then you try to put this all of this into the um, into the algorithm. Uh, the other thing that I think is a, is a very important. Uh, indicator is are those processes that uh, speak in favor of theory, uh, theoretical co um, coherence. Now, I, I think that this is a crucial element uh, that is lacking in uh, Wuhan Sang's paper uh, because, what, like I mentioned before, the, there are, uh, it's, it's, it's a piece of um, machine learning that is completely, or it seems to be completely disconnected from uh, larger body of scientific beliefs. And I think that this is an, an important part. I, uh, I call it uh, uh, GBDA. Um, I, I probably should change the name, but I, this is all I have right now. And um, it stands for uh, just a bunch of data analysis. So the idea here is that we have a lot of machine learning that all they do is just a bunch of data analysis. And that's good, that's good, of course. But just a bunch of data analysis is not really enough to 
uh, help us um, uh, sanction the, um, the credibility of our results. Just the fact that we can do high tech phenology doesn't mean that we should believe the results of, um, of, the, of, of such a machine learning. Uh, and finally, and this is something that I am not really familiar with, but uh, I'm aware that we need something like this is uh, trying to also factor in in the reliability indicator some form of uh, measuring if we need, uh, if we can, um, uh, some kind of error treatment or uncertainty. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of aware of the need of factoring uh, into the um, reliability that will uh, render or that will um, create this credibility that I'm after. We need to um, also factor in this, this error treatment. But um, yeah, but I'm, I'm still navigating my ways uh, here. And finally, the social formation of belief essentially is the idea that uh, not because our machine is top notch and works just fine and we perhaps have um, um, more than just a bunch of data analysis, we have very sophisticated systems that pick on, um, on previous knowledge, on perhaps theories, hypotheses, principles, you name it. And so they are quite robust in that respect. And, uh, but is, is, is it enough to, um, to uh, you know, grant that credibility that we want? Is it enough for people to, or like the, the relevant stakeholders to say, oh, okay, so I, I, should, I should, you know, believe this, or I'm justifying believing this result just because I have all of these relevant indicators that I'm telling me so. Well, I, I, I feel like this is, this is just half the story, or I should say two thirds of the story. The missing third is something that I have to do more, more with um, the social uh, formation of this, this the, of the, on the credibility of the results. Now, the problem that I'm facing here, so other than that, not being entirely sure how to um, do this, is that by doing it, if that is correct, if the idea, however um, general and vague it is, if that idea is correct, uh, it will presuppose that I need to have my results ready um, and pick on those results and then sort of grant the credibility. Uh, and But with the other two um, groups of uh, reliability indicators, the idea is that we are able to grant that credibility or that reliability to the process uh, so the credibility comes after. Uh, so there are no ulterior processes acting. And I feel like the, with the social formation of beliefs, that is it, that, that, the, the exact opposite is happening. I need to have my results. I need to have a, at least a pre-credible result, uh, result, something like, you know, I, I need to sort of have some kind of uh, justification about the results in order to start considering them as part of my of the construction of the social belief. So I, I'm struggling here a little bit. Perhaps somebody um, can help me out here to uh, to solve this problem. Perhaps this is just uh, not exactly uh, what I should be looking into. So, all right. So let me wrap up with uh, a little bit of the, what I see to be the merits and the limits of computational reliabilism. So first off, well, you already figured this out. It's, a, it's an externalist um, approach, externalist to the algorithm, that is, uh, as opposed to transparency, which depends on the algorithm. So you need, you need to look into the algorithm. You have to open it. You have to show the inner workings, whatever. Uh, in my case, that it. it doesn't really matter that it's a black box algorithm. It doesn't matter that we can never look into it. Um, all we need to do is establish which are the reliability indicators that will help me sanction this machine learning uh, algorithm as reliable, and then I can trust it, or I can deem the result as credible. And I think that that's a much better position than, um, than transparency. Uh, uh, what, one of the things that um, come to mind is uh, deep neural networks. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, quote unquote, here air quotes, uh, to open up the, the machine learning. It's very difficult to show the inner workings of such systems. With um, computational reliabilism, we don't care about that. So we just simply, you know, as long as we can sanction it as a, a reliable process or reliable system, I should say then uh, we are good to go. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not after 100% um, credibility or anything like that. I am not, I'm, not, I'm not after 
uh, absolute certainty. That, that would not even square well with um, process reliabilism, traditional reliabilism. And, and it's definitely not going to square well with, with my idea of computational reliabilism. Um, another, another merit or another um, interesting uh, feature that computational reliabilism has is that we have uh, a bunch of um, reliability indicators which can be independently justified. Uh, so we, 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 we have, I mean, this is point um, um, two and three. So we have several reliability indicators. So it's not centralized on one um, algorithm or one process. It's just transparency. Transparency fails. That's it. Everything fails. With computational reliabilism, we have a little bit more of, of, of room to say, well, we might have some, some indicators that are not so reliable, that, that are not really that great. But nevertheless, we have these others which are much stronger, and then we just balance out in that way. Um, and each one of them can be independently justified. So I think that that's, that's a great thing. Um, OK, um, the, the fourth point says it detects markers from non-credible results. Uh, that's what I want to That's what I want to believe. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, I think that one of the um, indicators like uh, theory, uh, theoretical coherence that I was mentioning before, just a bunch of the uh, that analysis would at least put a, a red flag on um, on the algorithm by one sign, right? So it would be just simply, okay, there is no way that we can fit this um, algorithm, the results of the algorithm, what is assuming this algorithm within a larger um, you know, body of scientific knowledge. So, um, okay, so also uh, accommodates different needs. Uh, in some systems validation or verification uh, are more important. Uh, or more present or part of the process of construction, design, constructions, uh, coding, execution, and so on of, of uh, machine learning. And in some other cases, is, is less so simply because, well, you don't have the data to, to validate it against. Um, and again, is prior to explainability, if that were the case. Uh, I mean, back to explainability, if that, that's the case. So there is no... Uh, there is no conflict with uh, transparency. There is no conflict with uh, uh, any notion of um, or any interpretation of um, uh, explainable AI. So yeah, in principle, we can uh, think about conditions under which certain uh, results are justified. We are justifying believing those results. And uh, and no, no, even think about explainability because it's really not an issue at this level. Okay, so which are the limits that I have? Well, it can be automated. Uh, that is pretty straightforward and kind of like hampers the utility of an algorithm. Uh, one of the things that, admittedly, one of the things that we want from these systems is to be fully or almost fully autom uh, automatic. So that, that would not be the case. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of um, discussion on human-centered AI and that sort of thing. So computational reliabilism, we essentially reject any full um, automation of algorithms and humans will be in the center of the process of AI, particularly sanctioning the credibility of the results and the reliability of the process from the start and therefore they just simply cannot be removed. So there is no discussion for me on the, on the need of a human center AI. Uh, sure, there is a second point, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one for me to, to come around is it's unclear the precedence order and weight of each indicator. This means that, uh, yeah, um, Validation could be more important than verification, or uh, I don't know, theoretical, uh, theoretical co uh, coherence could be less important than uh, expert knowledge, and that is definitely a problem. Uh, so I am not interested right now at trying to sort of come up with a hierarchy. I think that the, the best um, short answer that I have for this problem is to think that, well, there are going to be some reliability indicators that if you don't have them, you cannot you know, reasonably think that you're justified in believing the results, such as, let's say, validation because it bridges out with the world 
and theoretical, theoretical co uh, coherence and something like that. And, uh, and the rest, well, the rest is open to discussion, uh, open full discussion. But I, I really don't know if that I, I haven't I haven't really done um, the hard work there. So but I do I do see the this is a problem. And, you know, in, in relation to this, this point, um, what I call it, the, the, the tyranny of the few. Right. So it could be the case that a few indicators because of this hierarchy that I was mentioning just now, uh, this uh, in, we have a handful of indicators that are try, that are sort of doing the heavy um, weight of, you know, the heavy work of sanctioning results as credible, whereas a large uh, number of other uh, indicators are pointing out to the fact that they're not, that these results are not credible, but nevertheless, we are considering this, this few uh, first um, indicators as, as having more weight um, or more, or we trust them more or whatever it is that it's going on there and and the four kind of like tilts the the the, the end end result in this sort of uh, uh trying to establish the reliability of the process uh i think that i mean perhaps a, a safe way uh, a little bit extremist but perhaps a safe way to to go is to say well uh if one of these reliability indicators raises a, a red flag that's it the, the rest doesn't really matter we should um, um not sanction the the results as credible, but that that's, that strikes me uh, as, as a little bit of a uh, strong position. Anyway, um, so I'm I'm a little bit over over my time. That's all I have to to present. Uh, and well, thank you very much. And I'm open for discussion.